I want your soul. How much farther is it? Neil whined. I had to admit I was getting a bit tired myself. When we first decided to go on a camping trip in the Grey Smokies, I wasn't expecting it would be this far. According to the map, we're almost there, Gene said. You mean the map that covers the entire state? Almost there could mean a hundred miles, Sharon quirked. Gene whipped around on her. Do you think I'm that stupid, Sharon? Of course it's not a map for the whole state. I picked it up at the ranger station. It only covers the Tennessee section of the Great Smokies. He turned back and began trudging along. Well, pardon me. Oh, great map master, Sharon said out loud. Jean paused for a moment and then kept going. I knew he heard her and wanted to chew her ass out, but with all that had happened, he just kept going. My thoughts were interrupted by the sounds of struggling behind me. Turning, I found Mike wrestling with his backpack. It had gotten caught in between two small trees and had him stuck fast. Hold on there, bud, I said, trying to get down to him without getting my pack caught. Grabbing trees as I went, I worked my way down and got his pack unstuck. Thanks, man, he said, sweat pouring off of him. As if this trip wasn't tough enough. I hear you. You need to take a break for a minute? Yeah, he said, dropping to the ground. I chuckled seeing the smallest of the group panning like a dog in the middle of summer. Hold on here. I'll be right back. I struggled my way back up the hill only to find the rest of the group hadn't stopped when I did. I couldn't even see them. I ran for a little bit on what I thought was the trail but didn't see any signs. Finally, in frustration, I stopped and let out a yell. Jean, Sharon, Neil, where are you guys? I heard words echo back to me, but that was it. There was no answering call, no sound of brush being pushed aside as they came back to me. There was nothing. Even the animals didn't seem to be very talkative. It was quieter now than it had been the entire trip. Part of that was surely the lack of Neil whining and Sharon and Jean being at each other's throats. I wish those two would just give up and go get a room. Everybody knew they had it out for each other bad, but they didn't seem to get it. Or maybe they did, and this is their idea of foreplay. I couldn't say for sure. Either way, I was a city boy lost in the middle of the forest. Jean had the map, and I had never even been taught anything about directions or survival. I only came on this trip to hang out with my friends. A motel room in Gatlinburg, five friends catching some shows, shopping in Pigeon Forge. That's what I came for. It was Jean's brilliant idea to go on this stupid-ass camping trip. Even though he said he got the map at the ranger station, I knew he didn't listen to anything they said about which trail to go on. Jean was always the leader. He would have shooed them off and said he knew exactly where to go, even if he really didn't have any idea at all. Maybe I'm starting to see why Sharon hasn't hooked up with him yet. Maybe she's trying to knock him down a peg or two before he's ready to be civil. It had been five minutes since I stopped and yelled. Jean, Sharon, Neil. I called out again louder this time. And the only thing that got me was a louder echo coming back to me. I looked back at where I'd come from, only I wasn't sure of the exact direction. Jean had led us off the trail a while back, and I wasn't positive where I'd left Mike. The dense canopy of trees left a little of the sun peeking through, still high in the sky. At least I'd have daylight for a little while. Turning back the way I thought I'd come, I started back towards Mike. At least if we were together, there'd be two of us to find instead of having to search for one another. It was a long walk. It seemed like I got to where I was a lot faster than I got back. I suppose trying to catch up with the people who know where they're going will get your feet moving faster. It wasn't long until I realized I'd been walking too far. I had somehow missed where Mike was. Mike, where are you? I called once again, hearing the echo and nothing else. Looking around, I was sure this was where I'd left him. The trees all looked familiar, but then again, I didn't know how many millions of trees there were in the Smoky Mountains. There could be hundreds or even thousands of spots that looked exactly like this one. I began to question the wisdom or lack thereof of only one person having a map, and a thought struck me. I whipped out my phone and tapped on the map's app. Surely it could at least tell me where I am. Those hopes then crashed and burned when I saw the no signal at the top of my phone screen. Mike! I yelled louder, more to vent my frustration now. 
I then collapsed on the ground, feeling more exhausted and hopeless than I had in quite some time. And then I heard it. A faint call carried on in the wind. It sounded like it was miles away. Mike! I yelled out again. I sat and listened, which was easy since the animals weren't making any noise. Again, I heard the return call. I hopped up like a dog who'd heard its master's whistle. Taking a general guess at the direction I'd heard it, I began to march determinedly. It wasn't quite a run, but it was no stroll through the park either. The thought of no longer being lost, or at least not being lost alone, drove me forward. After a few minutes, I called again, and then I waited for the answer. It came from the direction I was heading, but somehow seemed quieter, like he was moving away from me. I broke into a run. My heavy backpack flopped from side to side, nearly making me stumble, but I didn't care. I was getting closer. I could feel it. And I didn't even see the tree root sticking up just enough to catch my toe and send me tumbling. I then woke to total darkness. Something big and heavy was pressing down on me. I panicked and tried to throw it off, but it had a tight grip on me. Thrashing all around, this thing held me with a death grip. I swung my arms, trying to punch it. My legs flailed to get it off me, but it wasn't happening. It had me, and it knew it. The most disconcerting part was how quiet this thing was. It didn't growl or snarl or anything. It just held on to me like its life depended on it. Finally, my energy was spent. It had won. All I could do was lay there and wait for the inevitable. And I waited and waited, and nothing happened. Maybe whatever it was had fallen asleep. I couldn't imagine all my thrashing around wouldn't have woken it up. I rubbed at my shoulder, which was now sore from the fight with my unknown assailant. As I did that, my fingers brushed up against the thing that held me. Out of curiosity, I rubbed it where it held me, and I immediately pitched a fit at my stupidity. It was my backpack. My head thumped off the ground in frustration at how stupid I'd been. Slowly, I unsnapped the latch that held the straps together and pulled my arms out. It was a huge weight off my shoulders when the pack rolled onto the ground. I'd laid there for a minute, having forgotten how dark it was when I was fighting to the death with my backpack. I was disoriented and pretty thirsty. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out my cell phone and turned on the flashlight. As I was doing it, I saw the no signal at the top of the screen again. I wondered if there would be any signal until I got out of this godforsaken place at all. I shone the light around and pieced together how I'd gotten there, lying in a ditch, in the dark, in the forest. When I fell, I must have hit my head on the rock I saw in the ditch that had a small patch of dark red on it. I reached up to feel my head and found a tender spot. That'd do it, I said of my unscheduled nap. Checking the rest of everything out with a flashlight, I found no other injuries. There remained, though, the original problem of being lost and alone. At least the animals were making noise again. That was somewhat comforting. Having evaluated myself, I shone the light around the area trying to figure out where I was. The answer was simple and frustrating. I was lost in the forest, at night, surrounded by trees. Letting out a sigh, I dug through my backpack and found some granola bars and a couple of bottles of water. Hunger pangs hit me in the gut like a line drive. I ripped open a bar and devoured it. Before I knew it, three of them were gone, followed by a bottle of water chugged like I was in the middle of the desert. As I was enjoying my feast, the animal noises began to stop. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end to hear such sudden and complete silence. Swallowing my last mouthful of water was so loud that it nearly made me jump. As my light drifted aimlessly, suddenly, I saw a pair of eyes glowing just inside the tree line. They glowed an eerie shade of yellow. I tried to remember if that meant it was a predator or not, but unfortunately something in the back of my mind told me the silence was already telling me it was a predator. Whatever it was strangely seemed to have no fur. Its gray skin made it look like no animal I'd ever seen. If anything, it reminded me of Gollum from Lord of the Rings. It was on all fours, but the front legs looked like arms. If I didn't know better, I would have said it was a child lost in the woods. But this was no innocent child. It crept toward me in a way that assured me it was hunting and nothing else. Nothing about the way it moved said helpless to me. I unzipped my pack and reached down to the bottom, all the while the predator was creeping closer. 
Come on, I said through gritted teeth, knowing it was down here as I moved things from one side of the pack to the other. It was getting worrisomely close now. One good leap and it would be within striking distance. I went ahead for broke and dumped out the contents of the pack, hearing a loud thump hit the ground. I flashed around with my light and found what I'd been looking for. My Glock. I grabbed it and pointed where the predator had been, fully expecting it to be right in my face, but it wasn't. It was gone. Whipping all around, I searched for the light, gun trained on anything I saw, hoping to catch a glimpse of it before it was too late. After a quick scan, I slowly panned around in a circle, searching more diligently for the creature, but there was nothing. Wanting to breathe a sigh of relief, but knowing it could easily be hiding behind any tree, I started picking up my belongings and stuffing them back into the pack. As I did, the animals began making noise again. It was somewhat comforting to think that the thing had left the area, but I didn't trust it totally. Once my backpack was repacked, I sat down and leaned on it like a pillow, with my back to the edge of the ditch and my phone's flashlight shining towards the trees. My gun sat on my lap ready for some quick action. It wasn't long until my eyes betrayed me though, slowly closing, causing me to shake myself awake. Over and over this played out with me struggling harder to stay awake than when I was sitting in church. My phone told me it was after 4 o'clock in the morning, the sun would be coming up in a couple of hours, and then I could continue my search for my friends. My phone also told me that it had 23% battery left. At that moment, I held a major debate in my head. Should I keep the light on and lose the ability to use my phone if and when I get a signal? Or turn the light off and save my battery, leaving me at the mercy of that creature? It was an impossible choice until I remembered the animals in the woods were making noises. They were silent when this creature came around. My only question was, did they shut up just for that creature, or did they shut up for all large predators? For the life of me, I couldn't remember. I took one last look around before powering off my phone. Leaning against my pack, my fight to stay alert continued. Each time my eyes snapped open, the sky was a lighter shade of gray. Soon, I could see vague outlines of trees looming over me, not frightening or disconcerting at all. At long last, I lost the battle and fell into a deep, blissful sleep. I woke to the feeling of sandpaper on my face, opening my eyes and seeing a deer licking my cheek, which made me nearly lose my mind. I jumped back, slipping off my pack and falling against the dirt in the ditch. The deer then lost its mind as well. It jumped up and galloped away like a herd of hunters were hot on its heels. Once my heart was beating at a regular rate, I looked around at the brightly lit forest. It was late morning and I was still alive. The creature had not come back to kill me in my sleep, thank God. I took that as a good sign. Standing and stretching, I tried to figure out how I was going to get out of there, let alone how I would find my friends. Shouting was out of the question now. I was sure that that creature would see it as a sign of weakness and come running like someone had rung the dinner bell. But how else could I find which way I was going before I fell into the ditch? As I stood there and looked back at the trail, I saw the branch sticking up that had caused this whole debacle. I drew an invisible line from where I was standing to the branch. I then followed the line through and extended it past me towards where I was heading. Looking up to the mountain looming above the trees, I tried to find a landmark to head towards. There was a huge rock that jutted out from the mountain with no trees around it. That was my focal point. I would use that as my compass. Speaking of compasses, I looked to the right and saw the sun rising into the late morning sky. With the sun in the east, I turned back towards my rock and calculated that it was more or less to the north. Having figured out where I was going, I kicked my feet into gear and started getting there. It was a no-brainer that my friends would be worried sick. They were probably already back at the motel making all kinds of calls and organizing a search party. Of course, I chuckled at my joke. I knew they were as helpless as I was in the woods. Gene pretended to know what he was doing, but truth be told, he was the worst of the group, mostly because he was too stubborn to listen to anybody else's directions. But then I had a thought. What if they ran into that creature? And that thought froze me in my tracks. That thing looked like it wanted to have me for dinner. Running into the four of them would be like a smorgasbord. I shook the thought away. There was nothing I could do about it anyway. But my cheerful skip in my step at having determined a direction was now gone. It was replaced by concern for my friends. As I continued walking, I thought about Mike. 
how excited he was to come along and see the Dixie Stampede for the first time. About Sharon and Jean, what a horrible couple they would make and how they fought all the time now and when they were just friends, or were they? I'd seen them sneaking little looks at each other when the group was together. Could the whole thing be a ruse? Could they be a couple already and trying to keep it a secret? And then there was Neil. I had no idea why I was even friends with Neil. He was one of those people who just started tagging along one day. Before he knew it, he was part of the group. Neil was always competing with Gene to lead the group, but he went about it a different way. He would whine and complain until he got his way. He wouldn't do it all the time, but whenever there was something he felt strongly about, he would. Neil didn't want to come on this trip, and honestly, I think we all would have been happier if he hadn't. Being alone with my thoughts had me making good time toward my destination. The forest wasn't as dense here, and it was slightly downhill. Good walking conditions. For me, the walk was going so well that I nearly started whistling, but I squashed that real quick. I didn't need any additional noise for the creature to track. As it was, I would turn and look over my shoulder from time to time, just to be sure no one or nothing was following. Each time I glanced over my shoulder, the sky behind me seemed to get darker. The sun soon disappeared, and I could no longer deny it. There was a storm coming. I was stuck. I had no shelter except for the trees, and rain leaks through them eventually. Even though I knew I would get caught out in the rain regardless, I stepped up my pace. Maybe there was a rock outcropping I could shelter under. As I walked, there was a blinding flash, followed by a deafening boom that knocked me to the ground. At first I thought a bomb had went off. I looked around and saw a tree burning on the mountain. It looked like some giant had ripped it in half. Staring at this apparition and wondering what the hell was going on, I saw another flash that lit up the clouds. This time the thunder was farther away, but still shook the ground. It was time to find that shelter before Mother Nature chose me as the target for her next lightning bolt. I ran towards the mountain as huge drops of rain pelted my back. It felt like I was getting hit by many water balloons. It didn't take long for the rain to intensify, quickly becoming a monsoon. The water came down so hard and so fast that the ground didn't have time to even soak it up. Since I wasn't on the trail anymore, I stumbled through puddles and many bogs, struggling to stay on my feet as the muddy ground tried to swallow me whole. I held my hand above my eyes, trying to see where I was going, but the rain came down in sheets, reducing visibility to zero. Through it all, I kept trudging as straight as I possibly could, hoping to find any shelter. Without warning, I ran into something hard. It looked like I had reached the base of the mountain. I kept one hand on the rock face to guide me while trudging parallel to it. Suddenly, nothing was pressing against my hand. I hadn't realized how much I'd been leaning on the rock until it wasn't even there. Then, I fell onto the surprisingly dry ground. Rolling over and looking up, I discovered I was in the mouth of a cave. I sat up and enjoyed watching the rain fall helplessly outside the cave while I was safe inside from the fury of Mother Nature. After a short rest, I began to rub my arms to stave off the chill in the air. I took my backpack off and looked through for anything that would be helpful. Fortunately, I packed a sweatshirt. I took off my soaked t-shirt and used it for a towel before donning my warm, somewhat dry sweatshirt. While I was looking around my pack, I pulled out another granola bar and devoured it, and then I downed my last bottle of water. Staring at the empty bottle, I held it out to one of the streams of water falling from the sky, until it was full. Putting the cap on, I noticed the water wasn't as clear as I would have liked, but I wasn't out of the woods yet and I might need it somewhere down the road. I then sat the pack down, leaning it against the side of the cave entrance, and pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. The light penetrated only so far into the darkness, and even the diminished daylight could only illuminate so much. After that, it was like a shadow wall, showing only a large black hole. I stared into the inky blackness before I remembered and felt for the gun in my back waistband. I pulled it out and checked it, then dried it off and stuck it back in my waistband. I didn't see the need to have both of my hands occupied if I stumbled. I decided to take a minute and explore the first few feet of the cave, finding nothing spectacular, and I was about to come back to my pack and set out the rainstorm when I smelled something. It was faint at first, drawing me several steps further inside the cave before I could be sure. My mind had to be playing tricks on me because I swore I could smell a barbecue. My curiosity and growling stomach overrode common sense and drove me a little bit deeper into the cave. 
The light of my phone illuminated my steps as I carefully made my way towards the amazing smell of what seemed like food. It wasn't long until there was a glow in front of me, a fire burning in the distance, just visible bathing the cave walls in an orange glow. As the promise of a warm fire tantalized me, drawing me closer, I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye that made my spine turn to ice. Coming from the far side of the fire was the creature that had stalked me the night before. At least it looked like the same creature. Its eyes shone yellow in the fire's light, and it walked down all fours and struck an amazing resemblance to Gollum from Lord of the Rings. I doused my light and threw myself behind a rock that seemed big enough to conceal me. Straight ahead was the pinprick of light that was the cave mouth and the outside beyond it. Even if I wanted to, the creature would see me and hunt me down if I tried to escape while it was within sight. Daring to sneak a peek, I leaned around the rock to see if it was still there, and what I saw horrified me. The creature was tending the fire, seemingly oblivious to my presence. It checked the pieces of meat that lay across hot rocks beside the fire. It then took a few off and set them aside. Then it walked toward the left wall and disappeared. I leaned out a little further to find out what he was up to, and I wish I wouldn't have. Hanging from a large wooden frame, tied in spread eagle, was a human male who had been skinned. The creature came up to it and carved several chunks of muscle with a large, primitive-looking knife. Once satisfied, he brought the pieces of meat back to the fire and laid them on the hot rocks where the cooked pieces of meat had been. He then took the pieces and disappeared into a hole in the wall. I quickly threw myself back behind the rock, breathing hard at the sudden realization. Oh my God, that thing killed someone and it's eating him now. My stomach lurched at the thought. It took all I had to keep from vomiting on the spot, but I knew how loud I could get when I puked, and I had no desire to let that thing know that I was in its house now. I peeked around the corner again and didn't see it. My eyes were drawn to the dead body hanging there. For the first time, I noticed there was another body strung up beside him. It was another naked male, but he hadn't been skinned yet. Two more bodies hung beside that one, one male, one female, and both naked. The realization hit me like a sledgehammer as I realized the naked woman was Sharon. Looking again, I saw that the men were Neil and Mike. Oh, no, 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 I said, abandoning any semblance of subtlety and charging over to see my friends. When I got over there and stood face to face with them, hot tears rolled down my cheeks. Their eyes were closed and none of them moved a muscle. I went to them one by one and felt for a pulse just to be sure. I came to the one who had been skinned first. He had no pulse. My only guess was that it was Jean. Next, I moved on to Mike. There was a scar on his neck and gore down the front of him. He also had no pulse. Neil was the same way, scar on his neck and no pulse. As I got to Sharon, I noticed something about her chest. It was moving. She didn't have a scar on her neck. I reached up to take her pulse and her eyes shut open. Instantly, she began screaming. I covered her mouth with my hand, but I knew it was too late. You need to be quiet and pretend you're dead, or I will be. Do you understand? I said, holding her mouth. She nodded, and I ran around behind the rock as I heard footsteps approach. I stood behind Jean since he was the biggest of our group, and I put my hands and feet behind his, posing in the same spread eagle fashion. My only hope was that it wouldn't notice me. I didn't dare move as I heard footsteps enter the room and come over to where we were. I stood as still as a statue. Only my eyes looked over to where Sharon was hanging, and I saw the creature stand and look at her. She had lowered her head again, looking every bit asleep or even dead. The creature then poked her breast with a knife, drawing a few drops of blood, but she refused to move. And then another creature stepped up to her, and then a third. They poked and prodded her to see if she was awake, but she wasn't moving. I could hardly believe my eyes there were multiple of them. And then panic grew inside me. How many of them were there total? If I knew it was just one, I thought about already shooting it. But if hundreds waited in the darkness on the cave side rooms, there was no chance. My thoughts were interrupted when I heard sounds coming from them. It was like chittering insects communicating. They spoke back and forth while standing in front of Sharon, who still refused to move. As the argument became a little heated, I noticed that one of the creatures looked in my direction. The longer I watched, the more I realized it wasn't looking in my direction. It was looking at me. 
It stepped around Sharon's backside when its eyes grew wide and it began to screech. The other two then looked to where it was looking and eventually found me. Their eyes narrowed as one came around in front of Jean's body and the other one stepped between Neil and Mike. The one holding the knife was closest when I gave up on my deception, drew my gun, and started shooting them. The sound of the shots in the cave instantly made me deaf. The only thing I could hear was my ears ringing. I grabbed the knife off the ground and cut Sharon down, and she collapsed like a bag of rocks. Get up. We need to go. What? We need to go. Now. I said and picked her up and carried her over my shoulders like a fireman. I struggled to carry her and hold the gun at the same time. She kept slipping off my shoulder and I would have to grab her to keep her on. The thing was, I was grabbing her naked body every time. It wasn't like I had a choice or I was enjoying it, but if I didn't, she was going to fall off. As I ran, my legs were starting to tremble, and I felt the rock fly past my cheek. I looked back, and there were many more of the creatures running after us now. I didn't have time to stop and aim, but I pointed toward the closest one and fired another shot. By some miracle, the creature fell. I didn't know if I'd hit it or the sound of the gun frightened it, causing it to fall, but either way... He was down. I had no chance to celebrate as the first rock hit me in the back of the head, nearly causing me to stumble, which would have been fatal for both of us. Instead, I pointed and fired another one, hearing a very satisfying scream. The cave grew brighter as the mouth grew closer. Then, suddenly, we made it out. It wasn't a cause for celebration, though. I glanced back to see a horde of the creatures following us out of the cave as well. So close and yet so far. My legs weren't going to last much longer carrying Sharon. I needed a break and I needed it soon. I didn't think they would stop if I turned around and called the time out. To punctuate that point, another rock hit me and this time on the back. I pointed and fired again in response, disappointed not to hear another scream this time. And finally, the inevitable moment came. I tripped. Sharon and I tumbled head over heels in a heap. By some miracle, I managed to hold on to my gun. I tried to jump but ended up falling to the side, still aiming and shooting another creature. They tried to get around us, but I shot two more. As I scrambled to my feet, I was able to aim better and I shot another, but they still greatly outnumbered us. There were too many of them to count and I only had so many bullets. I then aimed at groups, hoping to get more than one kill at a time. They still tried to flank us and I shot them as they did, but my gun jammed. I was able to instantly release it just in case any of them knew what that meant. I continued to aim at them in a threatening way. Perhaps they didn't know that I couldn't shoot, and they held their distance, not wanting to be the next shot, but they had encircled us and were closing in. I then looked back at Sharon to say goodbye, but she wasn't looking at me. She had my phone and was doing something to it, hopefully calling for help, even though I knew no help would get here in time to save us. Staring into the nightmare faces of these bloodthirsty cannibals, I prayed a prayer of utter desperation. Then suddenly... The most piercing sound came from behind me. Looking back, I saw Sharon holding my phone up with one hand and her ear with the other. I held my ears as well. The creatures tried to cover their ears but screamed in agony at the sound. As a group, they ran back to the cave holding their ears as they went. I couldn't believe it. I turned to Sharon as she shut the alarm off and smiled. Well, aren't you clever, I said. I'm not clever enough, she said looking at her naked body. I need to borrow your sweatshirt. I chuckled as I took it off and gave it to her. We should find a road and get out of here before they decide to come back. As we started walking, she explained what happened, how the creatures had surrounded them, how they thought Mike and I had already been captured. The funny thing was, Jean never gave up hope. He kept telling us to hold on that you would find us. Even when, don't tell me he was alive when they skinned him. And she slowly nodded. I can still hear his screams, she said with a haunted look. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I can't even imagine, Sharon. But even after they took his face, he still told us not to give up hope. Wow. After walking a long time, constantly looking back every few minutes, we came to the greatest sight either of us could imagine. A road. Within an hour, a park ranger came by and rescued us. It was the longest hour of our lives, keeping watch for the cannibalistic creatures to jump out at the last second and drag us back to the cave. But it didn't happen and our friends were never found either. The ranger told us we were lucky to make it out alive. They told us that many hikers go missing in the forest and are never seen again. To this day, I don't know what those things were. 
but I do know that I will never go back into a forest again for the rest of my life. I lost all of my best friends there, and I had to move on without them because they were eaten by some savages. <laughs>